stuff. Yeah. Um, left side of neck is getting tight. Okay. Um, right side flexors, groin, hip is inflamed and tight. Okay. Um, teaches Muay Thai, BJJ, Karate four to five days a week, wow. five plus hours. He's a southpaw, so I feel like right. we're compensating from the knee and it's all coming on to the right side now. Okay. Um, underwent prolotherapy and trigger point injections for QL okay. into the glute med, into the insertions of the actual like spine. Right. Um, found no relief. Still very active, so I feel like this is very much so continuing with overuse because he's still going. Hear that, y'all? <laughs> she knows her stuff. For 11k runs, boy, oh boy. 15k bike rides, Jesus. and then obviously still active with work. Yeah. Um, works with the Cairo regularly. Um, and has worked with a corrective specialist to right. patient. Um, and this was just through an interview that you got all this information, more or less? Yes. Okay, that's good. And that's what we want to do is be very specific with their analysis, ask as many questions. There's no really dumb question. Mm -hmm. um, being very thorough is the way so, yeah, to get there. So yeah, when I get into the assessment, I feel like I'll figure out exactly like what is firing and what is being overused. Mm -hmm. um, but just from all of this information by itself, I feel like all of the injuries um, on the right side specifically, because the QL does like a lot of the lateral flexion, right. I feel like it may be causing more contraction of the rib cage and more of an anterior tilt of the pelvis, which is why there's tightness in all of the fin. I'm definitely thinking of a lot of like trigger points. I really think the piriformis is probably a big issue right now too. Impingement, nerve yeah. ending is causing um, a collection of tightness <laughs> or you know um, changing the state of tissues. And then so I think the psoas and the piriformis is leading into like the SI joint pain. Right. Um, and then I feel like everything has further complicated the hip issues, even though we've gotten into like the previous strengthening the core bracing and the clamshells. I don't right. know if that's helping or necessarily harming if it's an overuse right, right now. Right. Um, so before we go any further, because it sounds like you've rarely investigated and found a common trend, which is overuse, and I wouldn't mm -hmm. disagree with that. That happens a lot with athletes and just with even sedentary people. We're spending a lot of time like we're doing here sitting in a specific posture. You can almost label that as overuse or under usage or uh, continuous cumulative concentrated components of compression and over usage or again under usage and just staying in a very dormant stagnant state of that said tissue can elicit a result mm -hmm. so from what you've already analyzed just without even going through an actual physical analysis is there an overuse uh, component there that's become a habit yeah, More or less. The QL is definitely right. taking over for everything, and then right. everything else kind of around it is maybe underactivated. Mm -hmm. And so. Now, has he been a type of person where he's been proactive with the types of um, treatments he's been seeking out in the sense of before they become a problem or they become cohesively problematic around these areas? Or has it already, already been like, that same mindset where he's grinding through these things that become almost to the point where he can't move anymore and then finally he's sewing into recovery methods. I think it's the second one. Okay. Um, I first met him like two years ago. Right. And when I was first doing like a postural analysis just to like practice with him, I really saw like hiked up shoulder, hiked up hip kind of thing. Right. So I already kind of saw a bit of a compensation and probably right. I wanted to say at that time QL is what I pegged it down to. Yeah. And then at that time, I kind of said maybe check out like physio, maybe do this, right. and it like never really happened. And then the knee injury happened, and then the QL happened after. So, so these I are years like, as they passed. So yeah. there was a, as fate would have it, these two met and they talked about a postural analysis. And at the time, maybe Carrie wasn't as well versed or well experienced or educated enough to say, well, this is where we got to start. There's going to be other underlying issues. But you kind of planted that seed for this gentleman. Um, and then fast forward the time, because it wasn't taken care of, these injuries started to compound. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that Carrie's really so into, and she understands with her training experience and knowledge, and then in turn, 
you know, teaming up with someone like myself is a lot of the issues are never directly related in a local area. There's a cohesive thing going on. Um, but at the same context, if you want to talk about something like that, what we're really looking at is our life gives us results from certain cycles or certain habits that we foresee every single day. Um, with that said result, it can only take us so far, and then we reach the pinnacle of success, we almost hit a plateau or a point where there's no more growth or progression there. Mm -hmm. We look at this gentleman here, maybe because of life instances or life events, maybe he had less time to sow into some of the things that he really loved to do that gave him different directions or movements. But on top of that, if we look at this body of work, no one's probably really addressed to the you know, 10th degree of the very technical components of, is he moving in space efficiently, cohesively with a connection or cohesive parts? What I'm trying to say is, are his feet mechanics working right? Are his knees mechanics working right? Are his hips working right? Is he creating rotation in certain areas? It's so important as trainers and it's so important as people who are being hired or um, you know people that are entrusted to do things like this, we are doing our due diligence to work on some of these things. And what it boils down to is just like anything else in results that we have in life, a lot of it has to do with habits. So we have to try to slowly but surely dissect people's habits and find out why that has given us an ultimate result. And from there, develop systems or develop strategies to kind of fine tune some of those habits because there's gonna be a lot of good stuff and there's gonna be some things that you probably wanna remove or replace with something in the meantime that can help them recover. Right, so again, if we were to, even without doing the assessment, which you'll probably get into, what would be the first step that we'd want to take after you've gotten all this analysis? You want to find out what his day-to-day -day activity looks like. And you also want to ask the, the pertinent questions of, what were the sensations or the results of the recovery modalities that he may be sewn into? And like you said, it was more of a, after the fact, he got hurt, there was problems, it was, it almost immobilized them, right? Or debilitated to the point where you couldn't activate or you know, be very um, consistent with this fitness. And then he sewed into those people. But what was the results afterwards? If we're able to attach an emotion or result to that, they can see the value of the systems or the questions we're gonna ask and in turn the replacement habits that we're gonna formulate. Because if we talk about his tissues or what his body's feeling like, when he's doing impact movements, when he's in a particular posture and he's executing those set actions and shapes and postures and blah, 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 he's getting that said result. Those tissues are exasperated, yeah. they're overworked, and they're just giving these sensations. Your body will tell you a story. So he needs to have a new habit or a new approach to prepare his body for those things that he didn't sense he wants to get into. Mm -hmm. And you understand that, you've been working with me for a bit and you kind of dug down this road before, but we're gonna to have to obviously go very deep into this. So again, we're gonna get through the analyzation, but what would be the first thing that we'd really wanna focus on? Because there's only so much time you can go so into a chiropractor, a massage mm -hmm. therapist, a you know, corrective movement so strategies. Therapies, yeah. Right, um, so. I already talked to him essentially about like what he's currently doing, and mm -hmm. he says, he's like, no amount of stretching is helping and i essentially told him that if he keeps putting it into the same position and then just trying to stretch it out it's right. not actually going to like lengthen it's just going to keep contracting and being tight exactly so i essentially told him we need to do a little bit more like trigger rollouts and essentially get the tension and inflammation to release right and then work on a little bit more mobility to create space back into the joint rather Absolutely. than just trying to just stretch the muscle back and forth because then it's just gonna keep getting tears and it's 100%. gonna keep, yeah. So Carrie's, you know, very knowledgeable and uh, is very in tune with this, you know, old age strategy that this essentially isn't working, you know. Um, the tissues end up in this position or end up with these problems simply because they're under duress from either too much length or not enough and the tissues just simply aren't prepared for that said movement space or posture because they're getting in an apprehensive state yeah, they're simply being taken to like right. end range right and that's yeah and then as soon as you exasperate them through that little bubble of protection which is essentially your body feels like uh it gets apprehensive and for some people it feels like a burning sensation of strain tightness and immobility creeps in so there's no amount of stretching cold muscles or lengthening these tissues where you get that consistent result of yes it doesn't hurt anymore it doesn't restrict my movements 
it'll feel like that when you push it past that presence of pain, mm -hmm. but you're essentially just resetting that problem. You get an initial burst of, yeah, it feels better, but it doesn't actually address the problem. So like Carrie said, one of the first things we really want to get into is reducing the tissues with issues. Mm -hmm. They end up in these problems or these constant results or, you know, sensations simply because there's a couple cohesive parts or compound parts where something's too loosey-goosey and then something's too tight and apprehensive and they work against one another and they kind of just fight with one another. And we can't really address specifically the QL, the SI. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times in a smaller intricate component and as they express more movements in a very more intensive, robust ranges of motion and postures and, mm -hmm. you know, velocities and impact, that's when you can really see that there's a couple places that have problems. But as funny as that conversation just went, you still need to break down the technical components and remove those quotients or remove some of those exercises that are causing that set result. What I'm trying to say is with impact, I'm running, I'm doing uh, lunging, squatting, very comprehensive, very robust movement patterns. With all those set movement patterns kind of creeping in, there's a bigger likelier chance that those issues will also creep back in. Mm -hmm. And until I've addressed the tissues issues and some of those really fine technical components of postural alignment to get joints in the right position, and activating right muscle groups and having ones that are sitting dormant, activating the other ones that are working too hard to just kind of chill, these things are just going to keep happening. So you probably, right, you take the impact out. Right, <laughs> the impact out. And there's a lot of cool, you know, new wave strategies that we can look at that will essentially allow us to alleviate that problem, still almost get the exact same result. What we're looking for, what we're trying to base this on or label it into is time under tension is our friend. And time under tension played with a different type of variable can really elicit a very healthy recovery or rehabilitative state. Mm -hmm. Give us the same you know, equivalent of reduce it, or not so much reduce it, but increasing some form of resistance training, which can be our own body with sprints and jumps and yada, yada, yada but it removes that impact and that likeliness for inflammation when there's certain kinetic chain, I guess, dysfunction. Because usually what's gonna happen with the body is it starts from the feet or it starts from the head. There's some type of dysfunction or postural misalignment in that set position. At some point, some muscle group or a collection of muscle groups and their working muscle relationships are messed up. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way of kind of saying it. And if we aren't addressing it over a period of time, some people end up as bad as this person, where it's like the QL's messed up and they've blown this out and blah, blah, blah. And we can't keep taking those same habitual approaches and expecting a change, right? That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting new results. Mm -hmm. So we need to, again, develop the right, I guess, systems or strategies in the right sequence or cycle that can really make people understand where to go where to execute, have a little bit of wiggle room, and a little bit of own self-analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think it's imperative, like you said, where we would start, and like how I always try to preach to my clients, is to start with rolling out your tissues with issues. With practice and at the trigger points where these, these problems have usually originate from, which I've shown in other videos, Carrie's used, she's used with some of her clients and some of her own methods. When we go after some of those things, it gives us a better chance that when we give certain exercises to alleviate some of the issues or um, you know, formulate new strategies of activation and alignment, whatever you want to call it like that, you get the result you want as opposing to just simply doing the exercise and hoping for the best. What we're trying to say is if the tissue is chronically tight, it's not getting the right reception, the right alignment, it's not going to activate right, only certain areas activate, other areas aren't, and you just keep running around on this wheel. So we have to take a bit of a different approach. And as complex as that may sound, it isn't really. If you start off with rolling your tissues with issues, getting into very small technical components of postural alignment and really small minute movements for certain areas of the body that haven't really done anything or now starting to activate in the context of giving other areas a break or a consistent basis of stability. And then from there, formulating programs that work on progressions safely without any pain, without any sensations of dysfunction, overtaking that set execution of the movement you're gonna get find lots of places for success and you can keep progressing that person. And it's just kind of a general natural cycle. Well, tissues issues, get into that proper initiation and warm up sequence. I like to say preparing for battle. And then from there, executing those bigger movement patterns that we just do in a primal sense. Mm -hmm. Like you, 
you learned in our assessment, the prime movement patterns are our walking patterns, uh, what a lunge looks like, um, rotation, is it coming from the right components of the body in respect to our spinal column and aligning those postural prerequisites for proper alignment of the spinal column that doesn't cause pulls and strains and sprains and rips in the certain musculature that surrounds that said spinal column, a push pattern, a pull pattern, um, hip extension, things like that. And again, Carrie's learned the benefit of looking at those really extensive and comprehensive uh, assessments, because I probably get to guess that you're going to probably work with this person and do that to some extent. Mm -hmm. I just kind of want to touch base with this before I lose my train of thought. Yep. Um, you mentioned that he's had these tears. Yep. Is this something that's been literally diagnosed and shown on a piece of paper? This is torn. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Because sometimes people feel a sensation or they just, their pain threshold has just been so overworked and they're so yeah, exhausted and out of context, actually, it's actually torn. Okay. So the PCL got torn right. in BJJ, like someone okay. moved his knee yeah. not properly, okay, and yeah. tore. Um, and then the QL, I believe is a grade two or grade three tear. Like How long ago? Um, I want to say November or December. And recent. It's still an issue. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there's just that happening. Well, and I mean, it's tough to break down a athlete's mindset, especially a combat athlete or people in these extreme sports with what their mindset is attached to and it's work through and grind mm -hmm. through. There's nothing wrong with that. I guess there's a bit of a strength in there, right? To be able to well, grind through. Well, the issue too is like the entire livelihood, right? Right. So you can't just stop working but <laughs> of course of course and that that is his bread and butter as he does teach and instruct that but he wants to live to fight another day literally pun intended here so um again if that's you're under he's been very open and vulnerable and very communicated with the type of lifestyle that he leads every single day and we can't overhaul that like right up front mm -hmm. what we can do is prepare him better for when he goes to execute these set instruction components. He's controlling some of these problems. Now, don't get it wrong, people. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, us trainers, I've taught carry, uh, I use on myself that can help control and navigate injuries, but they don't just magically appear. In fact, a lot of them stay, especially if they're very significant. And from what she's sharing with me, some of these areas are very significant. I've had some pretty challenging clients in the past where they've had comprehensive problems, but this one almost is up there. Like it's definitely <laughs> takes the cake considering this guy's lifestyle and what he likes to do. And honestly, we don't want to take that away from him. Yeah. But again, I guess our best thing is not only to create a proper comprehensive um, assessment. And I'm talking like the stuff I did with you with like mm -hmm. the feet and ankles, that's huge. Um, the rotation and all mm -hmm. that. And even if it's moving smoothly, at some point, if he's moving smoothly with a slower pace, he will feel some sensation of apprehension or pain or inflammation or tightness. He's probably so in tune with his body with all these variety of combat sports that he's had and a variety of postures and movements that he knows the difference between, you know, somewhat good pain and bad pain. Mm -hmm. And he's a very good mover. And a lot of the times what a good athlete needs or what somebody needs is what they don't necessarily want to work on. His body of work looks like lots of comprehensive torque and rotation and whips and blah, blah, blah. So some physios giving him a simple core brace or you giving him a simple ankle mobility strategy where everything else is staying stiff is what he's missing out of that bigger picture, mm -hmm. right? So he needs to have something where he's just working on that in the short term. And then he starts increasing or introducing examples of something that's more comprehensive, includes more joints or more positions and challenges him more where you introduce forms of impact again. And what I'm saying by that is he's in a standing posture, you know, changing directions, this and that. But until that time is met, we need to proceed very cautiously. And I guess what you need to do is create a schedule for him because he's mm -hmm. probably all or nothing goes real hard and you got to kind of dial that in. You want to harness the strengths of your clients or harness the strengths of our athletes, especially because they do want to get back to the point that they're at but you need to also be very militant and pretty strict on the type of scheduling they're hoping to adopt towards. Mm -hmm. So like you said, um, maybe asking him questions, if you show him a bunch of stuff that's very comprehensive with recovery, because what do you need? You look at his big body work, again, lots of performance, lots of impact, the result is his body's worn out. So what does he need to focus on in the next 
two weeks if he was to sign up with you tomorrow, literally recovery and that's it. Mm -hmm. He's getting plenty of the other approaches of, you know, torque and tension and impact and blah, blah, blah in his training regimen. Um, and you would actually almost suggest or challenge him to remove some of those postures or some of those positions that's mm -hmm. causing that said result. So we would look at those things. Um, and then maybe work at some areas that he could take into account that make make him feel like he's empowered and making his own decisions. Because I get that's probably part of this type of person, right? He's, he's a leader, he's, he's world renowned, or he's really looked up to in his dojo or whatever he's training people out of. And he probably knows some old school things that would work. So suggesting things like, could you train in water? Right, could I go in the pool and do some of those smaller movements? I don't do them as fast, but just simply training in water, the buoyancy is going to take pressures off of some of those joints. The muscles still receive resistance, but because gravity is not playing its effect as much, he can get some results there. Um, and those are things that he can do. Where he doesn't feel like he's. Are open. I know, right? <laughs> so they're not open. So what could he do to help boost his recovery? Epsom salt baths. Mm -hmm. And it's not even a negotiable. Like it's not negotiable. So you're telling this gentleman, hey. This whole body of work, remember, respect where you're at. What is the result? Every single day you get up, you feel like crap, whatever that looks like. That's something that you can suggest to him. And he's already been doing that regularly. Perfect. But... Right. And then obviously looking at his nutrition aspect. Carrie has a very, you know, well rounded nutrition uh, approach, getting a very anti inflammatory response type diet. He's eating very organic foods to help you know, facilitate that recovery. The tonic I suggest for you mm. with the turmeric and the apple cider vinegar, big deal about boosting your metabolic rate and reducing inflammation, increasing immunity. Mm. Those are some of the things we can do. Um, and those are things that, again, as a trainer, you could just simply give it to him and you just say, read this, adhere to it, follow it to a T. Yeah. That's something where you get an opportunity to be empowered and in turn execute for them. Yeah, I don't think the nutrition is an issue, but it could be that maybe he's also not eating enough for his body to recover. So, I definitely see. Yeah, that. yeah. So that's something. a lot of people don't realize that when they are injured, especially in this case of like how aggressive it is, right. that people will still want to eat less or want to go on a diet because they want to lose some weight, but they realistically need to be eating more in order for their body to heal. And Absolutely. So yeah, something it's a myth. Ask. Yeah, it's a myth because they're so used to working at this high rate of capacity and sweating profusely. And as soon as that's taken away from them, they're pretty extreme. Like right? our extreme athletes are pretty obsessive, and there's some there's something to applaud or celebrate in that sense. But mm -hmm. because of that extremism, well, when it's taken away from them, cutting, yeah, like right. Weight. So yeah, and that's not going to be you know that's not going to be productive or it's not going to help with the rehab situation like you said when your body's injured it actually needs more replenishment um your body of work should dictate how your nutrition looks like and i want to touch base on this right so you're right you should probably be eating more and it's just a certain type of foods that replenish um you know some of these breakdowns that he's had and they're extensively breaking down in a number of areas mm -hmm. so that again looks like um you know maybe he's getting more collagen in his diet He's getting more of that anti-inflammatory response and he can boost that or accelerate that through maybe not one tonic a day, getting two. Yeah. Right? Because he wants to recover. You have to always bring people back to that initial short-term goals. Nothing wrong with having long-term goals. But again, they're hiring you or they're reaching out to you to keep them on the straight and narrow and help them get to where they used to be. So always bringing it back to that can give it some perspective. Mm -hmm. Because I have to do that for myself. I'm pretty sure Carrie has to do that for herself. Always wrapping it around after you've had a conversation. Okay, you did this today. You worked on this program, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. you know, and if they relay the information to you, always wrap it around what their current body state is. If we look at his body work again, inflamed, dysfunctional, movement with pain. The first two weeks, he's literally rolling out some stretches, some easy bracing stuff. That's it. Mm -hmm. You want to relay that message in a way where it's like not only are you saying well this is what you really have to stick to but then because of course there's an ego involved and nothing wrong with that that's what's gotten them to their place remind them of the success they've had and the body of work that they had and the results that said mm -hmm. body of work is done for them celebrate it yeah. be like to them hey man this is only for two weeks think about all the work you put in for the last how many years you've been doing this and 
yeah, your body's broken down, but you still got it. You're not going to lose it over the next two weeks. And in fact, your body remembers that. There's muscle memory there. There's things there. You just need to celebrate that and take it for what it's worth. And it's almost like you're just taking a bit of a vacation. That word changes around the wordage or you're encouraging them to stick to the plan and in turn rewarding them for going this route and going to the unknown, that can make a big difference for them. So reiterating that and then you just asking the right questions after each particular um, you know, session or programs that you design. Um, obviously all the systems I've created and I've worked towards are done with extensive research. I tried it on myself, but you never want to make assumptions. So that's why you would still do the test and retest method. I find that a gym, you know, quoted by some of our pioneers in our industry, like Kelly Starr and people like that, is it's a testing place. At the end of the day, we all want to earn or enjoy forms of physical activity. In this gentleman's case, it's very extreme, it's combative, it's intensive, and then for the simple person, it's want to lose a little bit of weight and keep up with their kids. Let's celebrate that, but again, we can't make assumptions of what that would look like, so we still need to do, you know, those set assessments, and then in turn, we can make a lot of awesome rehabilitative comprehensive rehab programs that reduce impact and this and that but even if they're executing that they may still get a different result so a lot of what we're doing is a test and retest method when we're first building rehab program for someone this special or this unique so let's actually get into that i know you've been trying to you know tinker with my mind and find um, you know, the best strategies to go towards. And we already kind of touched base with it, but let's really dissect what that looks like. Um, so we've established the steps necessary to create any type of program, especially a rehab program, and this is super important again, is to do what first? Reduce the tissues with issues. Mm -hmm. Not only is it a internal thing, um, specifically with those tissues, getting that space and reducing the, the adhesions, but it's also a mental thing. If I have less pain after going through some forms of or elements of pain and the body literally gets a flush, you'll find your breathing better, you have more focus, and then in turn when you ask these areas to activate, they just have space. The tissues aren't like this and then aren't grinding, they're just flowing, more or less like water, yes. So we want to go through some of those things. I would say triggers to start with, just so he gets in the habit of doing that, and then as you're introducing exercises, and he will share with you, this exercise worked here, but this is still a problem, that's when you would introduce, okay, well, because you did the exercise and there's still a problem there, guess what, the triggers isn't enough. What I want you to now progress into is start with the triggers, now I'm getting into that local area of muscle release that you typically see with myofascial releases on rollers and stuff, people rolling on their calves and their quads. Those are for, I would say, extreme cases. Again, a trigger point release is more for efficient, time-savvy strategy where we insert, we go after the insertions of where they're getting the response and their suppleness and if it's limited, when we scrape and we manipulate those set sections, they just simply get more space and better activation. If we're doing that and then we're creating exercises where we're removing the impact, there's still a problem, um, then that's where you step up where you mention to them, well, you're gonna need a little bit more comprehensive release. And you and I both know that because we're practicing this and learning those strategies, so that's where we would start. And then when we get into a movement screen, um, with a rehab case like this, do you think there's going to be an actual, I guess, real specific um, warm-up strategy, or is it just essentially going to be a mobility program and you can just start? And you're going to kind of blend the two. I would say both. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Which is very unique to this, you know, person. I find people with really extensive injuries a lot of the time they don't necessarily need to re introduce lots of forms of resistance. When we say resistance, we're talking weights and cables and this and that. What we need to do is just go through some movements, test those set movements, increase that range of motion or challenges behind that and posture and execution. And then in turn, we introduce resistance training or bracing techniques. And those are kind of blended almost in a, I wouldn't say random section, but very, in a way where they're, yeah, purposeful. And they're kind of, their variety, there's a bit of a wave where it's like, this is just strictly mobility with some postural components, and out of nowhere you're doing a pile-off press, which is just completely st stable. And it almost mimics the same type of style that you would get out of real life physical activity. And in this case, it's very extreme with training and fighting and blah, blah, blah. So he has all these injuries. We don't want to put, there's contraindications is what we're looking for. Yeah. To review again, the biggest ones were he's torn 
knees. Run baby Tara's knees again. Same side that he tore the QL, no, they're opposite. Opposite. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of injuries uh, will correlate in a cross reference pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so anything like a squat, squat with weight, uh, could definitely exasperate a QL problem because that's your bracing you get from your core and alignment that you would earn or not earn from your pelvis. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, if you're overweighing your quads, as you said, you had quad tightness, you'll probably find somebody to do an assessment. Again, no assumptions, but. He's probably quad dominating a lot. Probably doesn't recruit too too much out of his glutes and hammies. So adding weight into a squat pattern probably a no no. Like you said, the side postural thing would be something that we would look at. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's timing again. Um, remember where he's first receiving information. Again, you'll know this until we do the assessment. What is one of the first things that we can earn to understand the ground beneath us? What would be the first exercise that we could really start with for this gentleman, say if this is a problem? I'm not gonna give it away, I want you to kind of answer it for me. Well, if we're just talking about even just from assessment, um, with how you even just check spinal stability through like a bird dog, mm -hmm. it's still not gonna be as much as a squatting pattern, but right. then you can still at least see the spine and then you can see how the hip extends and mm -hmm go from there, but are you talking about even further on the ground? Like, So if I go to stand in this situation, what is the first thing to touch the ground? Your feet. There we go. So, so we want to talk about the foot analysis. Right? Yeah, so that's because, again, we're gonna, a gentleman with these amount of, you know, comprehensive or compound issues, getting into something very comprehensive, again, a squat, a lunge, a this, a that, there's a bigger chance for that flaring up. Even if his feet move well, it just makes sense for him to just do some foot mechanic drills. Mm -hmm. Get that proprioception. Proprioception can happen as narrow as our feet together, but most likely we want to earn him in proper alignment of his posture, where his pelvis is underneath him, his shoulder blades are back, he's even tucking his head, and now he's working through the digits of his toes. Then he's going for toe crunches. Then he's going for lean techniques. Then he's going for that comprehensive rocking mechanism something like that is somewhere we can start the practice that takes a minute to three minutes for both feet mm -hmm. right we've gone over some of those things before that could be somewhere where we start and then after that because that includes some form of impact he's standing and there's something going on immediately we want to take him out of that said standing posture with gravity and all that stuff working into the equation some of those side profile things could be something that we could start with mm -hmm. right where um He's looking at some of those comprehensive hip mobility drills. Now, when you say the QL tour, he hasn't had any hip flexor tears, kind of aggravation to review? Um, not that I'm aware of torn, okay. just saying inflamed and tight, but essentially okay. sounding like the entire hip at this point. So, right. so he said groin, and then he said hip in general, which I'm assuming he's probably just meaning the outside of his hip. Right. Um, Right, and, and if we were to review the anatomy, the hip flexor is a collection of a bunch of muscles that connect into that hip joint mm -hmm. um, in a very defined, I guess, ripped athlete. You could literally see the pronounced components there. Um, but what is really going to be a chance of being flared up, not necessarily the hip flexor, is going to be our, you said it earlier, psoas. Mm -hmm. So maybe those are one of those comprehensive things where when we're giving them exercises like a plank, a side plank with some movement. I'm not a big fan of stoic positions. Mm -hmm. um, and he initially feels a good response. And then as soon as he goes and rests, all that inflammation almost compounds and builds in again. Then maybe when we, after we've given him a few rollouts, but just starting with the triggers and he's still getting that response, that would be one of the first ones we look at and say, well, not just your hip flexor, it's your psoas. So spend some time putting some pressure in there and releasing it, maybe just breathing into it, and the next thing you know, we're just doing really dynamic, almost freestyle type Yeah, I was gonna ask, I was like, what you hips. had to do with me earlier right. this week, because that's what I was also thinking. Right, so, but you're gonna replace those things or add those things so mm -hmm. we get something to adhere to and he doesn't feel overwhelmed. So yeah. we would do that, you know, down the path. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten some foot exercises the first way I would look at it. The second way I would look at it 
again, is um, some of those side profile movements that we looked at. The only issue with those is this. Um, it's quite advanced. Mm -hmm. And until we get into um, you know, some of those components of the assessment and how he actually moves, you may look to the naked eye when you're first glancing, oh, he moves well. Then when you analyze it, you're really, you're really strict about it. You'll be like, well, actually, he doesn't move well. I was just admiring the fact that he grinded through some of his problems and I could respect that. And I was like, wow, this guy's cool. You know, he, he works out well and I want to get to that point too or something, right? Like everybody has that, that sensation. Um, so after we do that, then we may see, okay, maybe something that comprehensive where I'm really great, really strict, you know, head alignment, shoulder blade alignment, blah, 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 can be really difficult. But what's some other things that he could, I guess, master uh, in respects to smaller minute movements where it's more of a linear thing and he just has to respect or earn, I guess, alignment. What I'm trying to say is this, if I get into a very unique posture profile, like you've seen in some of the videos, like you participated in bringing a side profile, shoulder blades are back, my arms overhead, this and that, and I have to intricately move my technical, you know, hit maybe an angle here, like, you know, a degree off, too tough for somebody who's injured. But what's one exercise from the first program or a couple exercises from the first program where he's earning a very linear movement? What is the first thing to start our push and up pro pattern? If we're doing it correctly, we don't want to exasperate problems that can happen in our hips, lower back, our feet turning out, our head, our shoulders. The, it's not a push up, but a, right. Eh? So we can get into that because that is a decent where there's amount, there's a decent amount of pressure then a calculated response where the pressure stays consistent, right? Like if I was to get on the ground here in a, you know, scapular push-up position, pretend this is the ground, my ankle, the murder, my wrist are here, my knees are here, my feet are underneath me. That's a decent amount of pressure where the ground force involves me having to strictly activate that. When I'm learning this comprehension or this movement, I'm not allowing this to drop in. I'm keeping this really strict and then I'm pushing out here. Just getting into something like that prepares the body for some of those spaces where the linear movements have turned into this and this. And he's actually doing that, he's just doing it in a very dynamic unilateral way when he's moving. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into something like that. Um, after that, what's another exercise from the um, first program, the systems that I formulate or use, that could really be useful. Now, this is one that would be a asterisk, or this is one that's you may throw in, you may have to modify a little bit. It has to do with planking. And if you've watched any of my previous videos and what she learned here, doing a strict stoic plank position, mm -hmm. a lot of the time it doesn't necessarily translate per se to proper movement or execution of movement, simply because the tissues are exasperated and tight. So if I introduce that same really tight, strict posture and I'm holding it for dear life, I'm exasperating the tissue that's already kind of worn out, too tight, too inflamed. I still need to formulate some form of movement, very minute movement. The knee drive? Yeah, so the half plank with the knee drive is a great exercise. Simply because, again, there's those points of contact, maybe now I have more, but full forearm shield, if you will. Mm -hmm. Shoulder blades are in. And what I'm getting into that half plank position is it's more reasonable, doesn't exasperate or lengthen the QL on the point where that digit and my legs being straight is pulling on this QL and if aggravating it. I get a better ability to tuck underneath. Mm -hmm. I get a better ability to pull here. And the cool thing about the knee drive is if I had bad feet, like we designed or we looked at, yeah, it's bad feet. I'm in dorsiflexion on my toes. And when I'm earning that knee extension, like I said in previous videos and what you've learned, that knee extension is such a dynamic move that's used in so many different profiles or postures. We get that when we're lunging, but where else would we get that as a fighter? A hip extension comes I'm hip extension. When I'm at a half plank and I'm doing this and tucking, I'm learning how to keep this organized in a way that it stays in a very neutral position. Even if I'm here and here, I'm still underneath myself. I'm not always sitting here and then in turn my foot's turning out and I'm trying to lean on my lower back. I'm learning how to keep that hip extension in the context of hip mm -hmm. or core extension. And then if I'm earning these proper postures and then I sequence right into that half plank thing, he's learning stability of the shoulder, extension to the feet, and proper initiating patterns. And over a period of time, with those smaller minute movements, it'll translate. Mm -hmm. So 
So I want to get into something like that. Yeah, and that'll probably come up like in the postural analysis that it probably is in an anterior tilt, so that will help to make right. realign. Right, now, just to reiterate for you, people that may not be as well versed or experienced, when we say anterior tilt, very common with most people. Yes, it's it's more or less the sway back thing, right? It's this going here. We say tilt, it may not look like an anterior tilt because it looks like you're sticking your ass out, right? So you're like, <laughs> that should be tilt. But this is relative to the hip position. And this is a very risky position because it already exasperates my lower back oh, curve. Yeah. yeah, it's over, it's over curve. Most people have that problem. So when we say that, we're talking here and I, I definitely had these issues here. So what you want to get in the habit of earning is a neutral position, a rib stacking position. You match that with shoulder blade position and even your head. Just doing this for a period of time with somebody injured like this could do wonders as well. Okay, uh, so we've developed some floor strategies that have a little bit of impact, but not enough that it's going to cause some problems. Then what could we get into, and this is rare that I would give somebody this set position, um, you know, into core bracing and alignment strategies or creating some type of stable presence. Now, normally I'm not a big fan of planks, but this is a unique situation. It's not a front plank, it's a... Side. Yeah, but are we going to get him into a long, lengthy position where his knees at terminal flexion and it's stressing out? No. From the knee? Yeah, you do a half side plank. Mm -hmm. And I want to get it maybe doing a set of, not even a lot, like you start with five reps, and on that fifth rep, he's earning time to hold it. There's still some dynamic movement where he's letting his hips touch and he's driving up. But maybe on that fifth rep, now he's really looking at when he started moving dynamically, did his body change that organization? Because a lot of the times, as soon as you commit to movements and the movement becomes more expressive and more lengthy, you can start with proper posture and then all of a sudden it turns into, yeah. right? So if he goes on his fifth rep and now he's noticed after his fifth rep, he's hiking through his chest and his head's forward. On that fifth rep, now he gives his opportunity to go, oh wait, I need to align those structures again. And now he's holding it for that stoic not long, 10, 20 seconds. And he's earning that said proper alignment posture because he needs that. His body doesn't spend enough time in those proper alignment strategies or positions. Just doing that over a period of time, like I said, will alleviate a lot of tension in certain areas. A lot of the areas will get a chance to take a break. Other areas will get a chance to stay turned on and then do it for a period of time. And that can just rehab the body in itself. Cool, so now we're at the side plank. He does well with those things. Um, just trying to think what's another great exercise probably from the first program where he's earning some form of stability because remember he needs stability and time under tension where the stability is being earned in a very proper neutral posture near the start of that said program after the scapular push-up mm -hmm. one of the exercises that I used in the system that was really effective it had to do with a band yeah, so that standing pull apart movement is going to be huge for him as well. The cool thing about the human body is this um, even with some of these extensive injuries, again, we talked about this earlier, was we celebrate people's achievements, and his achievements are very well rounded. As much as they may be injured, he's still able to grind through some of these things, but he's running out of real estate. That's what we're talking about. Um, but the body has an amazing opportunity or amazing way of recovering from these things by just introducing a very slower, impactful position that's very similar to that said, very expressive whipping type position. So getting into that postural balance of separation is a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, another exercise that could be really good um, is a hip bridge. Now I wouldn't get him in the global one that you do from the first program because the rotation could be like you mean on the bench? Yeah. Yeah, we're both. So if you're gonna test it, what you would say is I'm just doing a ground hip bridge. Now, in a rare case, I usually tell people to get in the habit of flaring out their knees for this said ground hip bridge. But in this case, would I want to give him that if I do an assessment and he walks like a duck and turns his feet out like crazy and doesn't use a big toe or anything? I'd probably do the opposite. I'd actually put a adjuster into his knee position and I make him do a hip press where he's squeezing his knees and actually earning internal hip activation. Mm. 
And if he gets he's putting a ball. Yeah. And making sure that when he does his hip raise, he's not arching through his lower back, he's keeping his pelvis tucked underneath him, getting away from again this, he's really formulating this type of position. And he's squeezing his knees and driving it. Yeah, I don't think the feet is the issue, but uh, a doctor still might be underwear right. for sure. Right. And if we get him whipping on those adductors and pulling abduction and then trying to pull it back in right now with some of the comprehensive compound problems you could have, it might exasperate or cause some sensations. We're gonna introduce those soon, just not right, right away, mm -hmm. okay? So if he does that and it feels like he's getting pain sensations or he feels like he's getting um, not much work from it, then yes, the lever would get longer. Or I do both. I just sequence it in a way where they're not back to back and the endurance is able to rebuild, mm -hmm. right? I wouldn't go do a hip bridge on the ground and all of a sudden jump on a bench and do the press, right? Like those areas are pretty exasperated, they're pretty tired. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't get into that per se. Um, okay, that's a good one. Um, there's some stuff that we never got a chance to get into in light of this pandemic when we started moving through systems of the, uh, you know, training systems or the training progressions I create, the templates, if you will, that he could also introduce. And it kind of goes, hand in hand what we're talking about in respects to our um, our feet position, our control of our feet and what that relates to posture. And the fact that when we are moving as humans, we may start in what we call a bilateral position, but the majority of our movements are what? My one leg leads ahead of the next, which is what we could call yeah. unilateral, right? So we have to train that dynamic, but not in such an explosive manner. We're kicking, we're doing this and blah, blah, blah. So what I would like to think is we can also get them back into a standing posture at this point, and maybe we're doing something where if there's no pain, he uses something in the progressive program that I use where he learns angular control patterns or angular, I guess, extremes in the sense of creating one leg stoic, uh, stable concepts. So what he would look at, toe touches. Yeah, airplanes is a little too dynamic. You're gonna make him very- He's done those before already. Okay. So. So we're going to do something where it's a lot more, I guess, um, linear. Okay. Okay. Now, excuse us, we're going to grab this because this is probably something we should share. I need to have my feet, you know, straight ahead over my hips and in turn, my shoulder blades should be down and back. But there's a lot of stuff that goes into movement. Okay. Everything should connect and move. But that's not what happens when you move. It turns into a very unilateral position. So what we got to get in the habit of doing is learning how to earn stability on one set side where it's a shift. I shift my weight to presence to one particular hip because this leg isn't necessarily gonna move. When I'm first starting this movement, it seems like you're not doing much, but I start on the solid ground. There's no type of instability or height off the ground because I have to earn these proper patterns properly, okay? So I'm sitting through the ankle joint, knee joint, hip joint, and I'm levitating or leveraging that said loading sequence where the weight's going back over my hip. Do you remember, there's a good chance he's overloading this bad boy. He's had it torqued too, and now it's a bad knee or whatever, right? But in the sense of this, when I go to move out of these profiles, instead of a airplane where it's very dynamic and can cause more chances of this wiggling and losing his presence, he's gonna break it down. So he's gonna go top, exactly. He's gonna go toe touch. But when I do this, if you see from this profile, maybe move the phone down just a tad. When I do this, what I don't wanna have is me not being in control of the weight distribution. That's what we're talking about. If the weight changes, that means momentum governs my movement. And when momentum governs my movement, there's a bigger chance of something pulling and ripping. So you're not transferring weight completely. No, you're actually keeping it here. I call these toe touches, if I was a cue somebody, I would say there's cold water or hot water there, and you're not gonna stay there. Mm -hmm. You're gonna stay here. As you see, there comes a component of my upper body activating the same anatomy trend. The shoulder girdle, mm -hmm. which we got from the other exercises, has already been established. You've warmed that area up. And now you're adding the components. When I go to the side, I'm sitting through the profiles of my hip. And my weight doesn't change, right? I'm not going and changing it because I'm not in control of that. This mm -hmm. is about building control. And then finally, if I'm gonna hinge back, why would I do that? let my hips, or sorry, my torso drop. What am I trying to get away from? This is probably one of the biggest reasons that he's having issues now, or maybe before, and it's just when he got injured, it exasperated his so problem. So you're earning flexion instead of knee loading? Right, a lot of people, when they need to get into a 
hinge pattern because they're so dominated with these types of positions. When they hinge in front, and they have to do stuff like that, it turns into this. Look at that position. Just my lower back in general, overextended. What am I loading here? Joints. And then you hit a force, something breaks. So I have to be in the habit of hinging cohesively down the chain. And because these are smaller movements, it eventually lead into the more extensive movements where everything's connecting and flowing. Mm -hmm. So I have to get, break down the mechanics and get into those said sequences. And I'm earning this, I don't pop up, I stay here. Because eventually, holding that stare, eventually we're gonna get into elevation. Whereas if he didn't earn those properties of proper positioning, and he goes to do this, because it's elevating, he has to work lower, he'll transfer it more. So you have to build him up to that position, or any client for that matter. I do this with all my athletes, even my sedentary clients. Because they're learning how to keep their footprint consistent with the weight leverage. And the angles are shortened. They're not expansive like you would get out of a very long lunge position. So you want to work with their strengths, where their body's currently at, and in turn, build those strategies of awareness proprioception, stability, balance, that involves posture, okay? So those would be some of the things that I would keep creating for that said program. I mentioned to you that there was things like a clam shell that was introduced to his training regimen to in turn probably strengthen certain areas such as like his glutes. Um, but if we talk about a clam shell in its entirety, where are the limitations in that said clam shell? It's rare that the hip is working independently. If I'm doing a clamshell, pretend I'm lying down, people. So if I'm doing this, where does that ever happen independently here when I'm in a standing profile and I'm squatting and my depth change happens and my postures change slightly, but my, but my core bracing and my positioning or the shape I chose should stay consistent, right? If I'm squatting, my feet are shifting and my lower back's doing all this, I'm not in control. So we can get nice. Right, and that's and a lot of things, there's a lot of great exercises out there that in theory will give you this, this, and this, but if you don't focus on those prerequisites of really strict, you know, postural prerequisites, it loses its purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, if he does that said organization that we talked about in that side profile, and he's doing this and I'm not feeling much, then yes, you would introduce that, 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 and that crazy one. Are you doing all those different movements? But I would still start him off with they said, Clam shell and see how his body responds. Okay. But the clam at 90 degrees then. Right. Okay. That could be another exercise. And remember, the way we're talking about this right now, there's a very specific method or there's a very specific sequence of how we're strategically placing each exercise. And what we would do is not just sit on one set exercise, complete two or three sets. He's running through it like a circuit. He's working on a different variety of things. We do that not only to allow um, the body to start firing off in a collection of areas and keep your body moving, but to, especially for our athletes, they have to keep moving. That's what they know best. So if they're just sitting on, here's a clamshell, do two sets of 12 or 15. Are they gonna adhere to that when they sit and do nothing and they're so used to sweating? That's why a lot of the times, and this is no knock on physiotherapists, they're giving the right stuff. If we're just doing that set exercise for two sets of 20 and there's no variety and you don't jump into the next thing, people aren't gonna adhere to that because it just simply becomes boring. And you don't wanna have that as part of the equation and they attach their mindset or they attach that experience to something like that because then they won't stick with it. So we wanna keep that circuit moving because it's, it's kind of aligned with what they're used to. So we would just keep going in that sense. So after they do the clamshell, then yes, we can get into that very comprehensive movement strategy where he's earning all those particular steps. So like internal rotation yeah. into like the 45 degree angle for kickback? Well, let's, how about this? We'll, we'll actually show you guys what that looks like again, because our last video wasn't all that great too. So grab that, uh, what we were looking at 
is our clamshell. Now, a lot of the times people are set up into this, they get into what they feel comfortable, which can turn into this. The only issue I would have with that is a lot of the times when we're living our lives, we are already predisposing ourselves to that rounding position. And we lose the ability to properly formulate or properly create that proper initiation pattern that comes through pulling things in and pushing things out. And forces happen on all varieties or angles. And if we don't create the other understanding or the opposites of what we're going through, a lot of the times, again, we will never formulate the proper way of doing it. So if I allow, if I allow somebody to get into a position and they're doing this, I'm leading into their issue as far as I'm concerned. They're not necessarily earning anything that they need to fix per se. They're working this and in theory it's gonna work this, but, but I haven't really respected or asked them or challenged them to get into those set positions that could really, over a body of work and designs of programs, execution could fix that thing. So I wanna get them out of this. I don't care if they feel comfortable in this. They have to challenge new things. So I would go here if I'm gonna start with my clamshell. Reason being is this is an extreme position but I have to earn it behind my shoulder blades. Even I'm tight, you see this arm creeping forward. Should be about here, okay? And I have to pull my shoulder blades back. And if I'm not aware of it, see from this profile here, my lower back will bend. So what I'm gonna do with my pelvis, I'm gonna tuck it underneath. I'm gonna even tuck my head. Even starting into this profile for a lot of people will be challenging. From this set position, what I'm gonna try to do is earn that. But when I earn it, as you can see here, this is a huge step. I'm not here. If I was to show you out of that profile, I'm not here where my back is arching and my knees aren't in line with my hip joints. If I end up here, what am I gonna exasperate or cause a problem with when I get too long? My lower back overextends and my quad takes over, and I don't want that. They're already doing too much. It has to come from here to here, which should be supporting my body when my foot's on the ground and I'm rotating and pivoting. Either way. So I have to respect that knee position. And if this is easy, then I need to get into a bunch of other steps because this by its own doesn't really do much. What I'm gonna do now here, I'm gonna slide the camera a little bit this way, the other way, there we go. And turn it right to your right, your wrist turns this way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Told you we needed that, there you go. So now, if I'm in this said position, I need to add more to this. Now what I'm gonna do is lift the, calf, the other calf, I drive my knees in, take a quick break. This is where it gets really crazy. What I need to start learning is an internal rotation in the context of me not kicking my leg back, because a lot of the time when there's dysfunction, I only move linear and my body needs to rotate. And that causes a lot of over -re reaction of the foot externally rotating and me using my lower back. So when I do this, it's very, Specific to me kicking the leg out here, not tucking my heel underneath me. That's why you have to position your knees in line with the hips, shoulders back, even your head back. So when I'm in that position now, what I'm gonna to try to do is kick back at 45. The reason why I do that is do it slow. There's no impact from the ground. The glute fires off, the obliques fire off, and I still work on earning that said alignment that started. And even this bottom leg and this bottom presence of my body to the ground stays intact. So I'm pushing tension there. Then I'm gonna drive it back in. I'm gonna to try to drive it back in at 45. And I do it really slow. This time under tension in these areas activate, again, without impact. Over a period of time, you're reorganizing or reshaping those set structures to be in a proper alignment. It takes tension off the areas that are over-exasperated, like the QL. And you're still working the areas that aren't necessarily working in the first place and have gone dormant. So I could build into that as long as this goes well. And I'm very strict on how I'm developing his prerequisites for the posture, that is huge, okay? From there, now I can start getting to some of those things. Also moving forward, that's another ground exercise. We've got about five or six exercises, I think, into the program design. What's another one from the first program that could still elicit a good change, get some type of movement, but isn't too aggressive? And we need to establish that when he's in a position, say if his feet are turned out and he's always rotating and pivoting, he probably lacks a lot of internal core strength that allows him to get his pelvis in the right flexion or right alignment. He does that anterior tilt. I'm lying down because pretend I had a ball from the first program. What's a great exercise that he could do? Leg raises? Yeah, so instead of just doing a leg raise, he's gonna squeeze a, a Swiss ball of some sort 
keeping his head down, keeping his shoulder blades back. He's gonna to try to lift his legs and just bring them down. And he's gonna do it very slow, instead of really quick. And we're hoping that he can get his legs even up towards his hip joint, and then he's gonna come down slow. He's gonna to try to squeeze that ball of his ankles, about mid ball, if I had one here to show you. But the key here is impact out of the equation. He's earning really strong internal, I guess, thigh and internal core muscles, not necessarily those abs that are important, they look nice, but they don't really formulate the control of the hips. He's getting hip extension without the presence of impact again on the ground and really explosive stuff that he does from his knees and kicks and grabs and yada, yada, yada. So he's getting into some of those things. From there, maybe 10 reps. And remember all these exercises only have about one or two sets. At that point, you're almost ready to go with where his first program should be. Don't overwhelm him with stuff. And he's already getting a lot of work through his instructions or through his, I guess, again, body of work that he's doing when he's teaching his clients or he's still moving through some of those movements. He needs less, less is more in this sense. Remember, we wanna respect where he's at, that's inflammation, problems, overdoing. So that's essentially all he'd really need from that set first program, in my opinion. Is there anything that you would like to share or you could think of that we could add to this equation. You can actually Again, I might have missed some of those big pertinent things you said about in respect to the injuries, maybe at the upper body, and there's some exercises you could think of. I'm actually thinking of one right now that you taught me mm, about two or three weeks ago that we actually went over. Are we talking about 90-90? That might be a little too aggressive. So it was like we could do lying down ones where it takes the hip flexors out of like such an extreme position. So, so kind of like those down. window wipers, like, okay. that's what I was thinking of, but I don't know what I taught you. I was thinking the one that you actually taught me where you're lying on the ground, you pull your shoulder blades back and your legs are up. Remember you were lying on the ground and you, your legs are in the air and you're pushing your lower back in and you're tucking the chin. Are we talking but, about some, um, like, earning spinal space? Yeah. Hold ons? Yeah. Like the elbow stretches? Yeah. That would be at the end of the program. Okay. So actually, I'm gonna grab the phone here and Carrie's gonna show this one because this is a great exercise. And now we've pretty much developed this gentleman's first rehab program, which is pretty exciting. So go ahead and grab the crown. I'm talking about this one. It was the lumbar stretch, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's one where I like the overhead. Yeah. So let's go into that. Let's show the people what we're looking at. Essentially getting into your long lever dead bug position. Right. Keeping your legs as straight as you can, but you're going to internally rotate the feet, hips, and then like you're hugging someone, you are going to apply tension, making sure the posture is aligned, low back into the ground, straight back core on, and then we're slowly just going to bring the arms overhead, and this is just going to create length through the spine. Ooh, something just cracked. And then we can hold for about 30 seconds, or we can even just reset and move through it. Excellent. And the reason why this is such a great exercise is the client's gonna earn extreme positioning where he has to keep that time or she has to keep the time under tension in those set extreme positions. Impact is been removed, velocity and change of said posture is removed. But there's still some form of movement, which I really appreciate. Because again, a stoic holding pattern isn't going to necessarily rehab these areas when the body of work or the work that this person wants to do is very dynamic and is very intuitive or very chosen to be a very explosive, considerately repetitive movement with lots of explosion and, you know, um, I guess risk involved when you're facing an opponent and everything has to be very explosive and attacking, if you will, okay, and very quick, okay? So he needs more of a slow, methodical approach to not only allow his body to recover naturally, even without these injuries, but especially when these injuries are present, mm -hmm. okay? Anything else that we think that we could add out of that first program? Um, honestly, not really. Yeah. So 
that's where we would take you know this gentleman or anybody with a very unique um, I guess compound issue or injuries that surround the lower extremities in this case this gentleman's had you know torn knee torn hip torn uh, you know QL which is essentially near the lower back and that's where we would go about um, you know developing the right programming for him um, particularly the system stays the same where we're first reducing the tissue issues we're getting into some movement that cause him to um, you know slowly open up angles but it respects the postural alignment and postural control and then in turn earning some of those longer lines of resistance but without those forms of impact and then we put some progressions and regressions in there which is really nice mm -hmm. right so he has an ability to not necessarily have to tie into you every single day he can work through the varieties and just relay the information to you the result of those set exercises was this this and this and say okay well replace this one with that one or don't do those or actually you can do them both right like the hip bridge for example he does the regular hip bridge on the ground it's super easy puts it up to a bench the lever becomes longer that could be a big deal for him where now he's getting longer activation through a longer hip range which mimics the same type of movement that he gets when he's extending his hip kicking people grabbing people whatever that may look like but it's in a kind of condensed position where his knees are underneath him um, and he's activating the hamstrings too his pelvis is being aware and he's tucking it underneath in a proper hip bridge or sorry hip press position out of a bench so those are awesome um, you know things that we could do for him thanks for tuning in today this was actually pretty pretty awesome i would say anything you want to add to anything that we went over do you feel like now with this conversation that we had um, some of the systems and strategies that we're confident about executing on we just need to fine tune it now for that said athlete or client are you getting more of a grasp of that the first step is always rolling up the tissues it's used well, yeah. i already had that in like mind so yeah. it's just like kind of good to kind of go over it and just like reiterate that the systems are correct yeah. if we will and yeah then yeah, and this is where, again, where we start. We start with the linear movements, more or less. He's so used to getting ranges, and different angles, and yada, yada, yada. Try the limiting linear stuff, mm -hmm. but don't keep him stoic. Keep it moving and flowing, and really have a big portion of roll-ups. Take his time with the rolls, take his time with the really small, you know, foot dynamic stuff. We could do some of those standing profile things with the reach and that, mm -hmm. but base it upon how he feels. And maybe just change the sequence. Maybe instead of a warm-up, like you did at the end there, he did that stoic thing. Maybe he's finishing with that, where it's, he's finishing with that comprehensive thing. It's just a different, unique pattern for that gentleman or somebody with this unique case. Cool? Mm-hmm. Thanks for tuning in today. It was awesome.